As I promised yesterday before dinner, I do have a summary of the, of the full day yesterday, and we covered quite a bit of territory. Um, I was talking to um, Rachel Taylor at dinner last night, and I, you know, we were rem reminiscing back to the uh, initial meetings and phone calls of the planning committee, and we would go on for hours and hours and hours. There's so many perspectives and so much material to consider with this topic and trying to narrow it down and decide what could we cover in two days was really daunting. But we, we you know, we, we did the best we could and I, I, I think we've, we've hit on the things that were important. I went through each of the um, presentations yesterday and tried to come up with one, in some cases maybe two, nuggets from each presentation. So don't, don't get too hard on me if I didn't do justice to all the work that that all the presenters did because there was way more from them than you're going to hear right now. But, you know, starting with the film of Cray Deeds, the interview with Cray Deeds on 60 Minutes, which really illustrated all the points we're trying to make in terms of the, the risk, the frustrations, the emotions, the love that family members have, and, and then the, um, the terrible tragedies that can happen. It, it was all succinctly presented there, and I think you know, even though no one said this, but there, there was a gun in the home. And no one talked about that so much. It didn't have ammunition in it, but I think a 24-year-old who's uh, on the dean's list at William & Mary College was able to get ammunition without too much trouble. So, you know, we didn't talk about that explicitly, but it was there. Dr. Tom Insel was our plenary speaker. And while he posed many questions and said many things, one of the things that struck me the most was, is mental illness associated with violence? And his answer was yes. Untreated psychosis, especially paranoid, if you add substance abuse and a history of violence, that's where there's the association. Uh, with treatment, he says, you can bring down the odds from you can bring down the odds from 1 in 600 to 1 in 9,000, or bring up the odds from 1 in 6,000 to or 1 in 600 to 1 in 9,000. So, so he says, you know, treatment, early detection, those are the things we need to be focusing on. He also really laid down the, the numbers on the fact that suicide is a much bigger issue than homicide. Vicki Mays started us off with operational definitions for many of the terms that we're using in the workshop. Um, just the, I just want to highlight that for mental health and violence, we're using the WHO definitions, uh, mental illness, mental disorders, and conduct disorders. We're using pretty much American definitions, but I think they're accepted worldwide in terms of the American Academy of Adolescent, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry on conduct disorder, and then the DSM on mental disorders. Then, then we moved on to ecological frameworks where Eric Kane told us that risk is cumulative and he also did a nice job of showing us the size and impact of the problem, especially in the United States, but also globally. Janice Jenkins, the nugget I have from her is that decades of empirical research demonstrate the centrality of culture. So culture is, is something that we need to be aware of in this. Uh, Mark did a nice impression of Paul Applebaum and gave us Paul's presentation, um, Paul focused on the fact that there's perceived risk of mental illness and violence, which is vastly exaggerated, according to Paul. And then there's measured risk, which is there. It's incremental. And one of the slides that I remember clearly from that presentation is the one where he went through all the disorders that are highly associated with, uh, with uh, a population attributable risk for violence. And personality disorders was high in the list, but the highest wasn't even what we call a disorder. It was hazardous drinking. So it's an individual who scored an eight or above on the audit, which is the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test of the World Health Organization. And you, it shows that you don't even have to meet diagnostic criteria for an alcohol or drug dependence in order to be associated with violence. And we're going to hear more about that in our panel on alcohol this morning. Uh, James Blair told us that problems in brain development uh, affect the threat circuitry. Uh, I'm not going to get into the more technical aspects of his presentation, but I thought it was important that he's noting that the stress circuitry and the decision to, uh, to fight or to, to do something violent is affected by stress, 
trauma, frustration, poverty, diet, genetics, and alcohol. So all of those things are extremely important to the uh, acting on the individual biology of the, of the person. Right after lunch, we had a very nice panel of people who told us about their lived experiences with mental illness and violence. And I, I can't do justice to all the speakers, but Daniel Fisher really was emphatic about the fact that we need to change the media's depictions of mental health and violence, or mental illness and violence. Ellen Sachs spoke very movingly about her experience with restraints and the need to have better controls over when and how restraints are used. Harvey Rosenthal really stressed the recovery movement and how important that is. It's not just the, the system, the mental health treatment system, but the recover, recovery movement that can play a role. And then Robert Bernstein, as the discussant, reminded us of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the rights that that brings this, this important population, as well as he told us about the history of the community mental health the community mental health services movement and what happened with deinstitutionalization and the original plan to have well-funded community mental health centers. It was is actually signed into law by President Carter and then never funded because Carter cited it during his lame duck period and then Reagan became president and never funded it. So we, you know, part of the problem that we're still living with today is the deinstitutionalization, which was a good thing, and then the follow-through, which didn't happen, which is giving us this lack of treatment that's important. Detecting and assessing mental health dysfunction and the risk for violence. Uh, Dr. Faisal said that there are instruments, and he, he's looked at all of them, but the evidence points to the fact that they can be pretty weak in terms of prediction, except in identifying risk groups. So certainly in terms of population health and in designing prevention programs, that's important to know. Uh, Dr. Pardini told us about the need to develop a good screen for elementary school populations in order to um, focus on, on which students would need extra supports. And then we had a presentation on bullying from Dieter Wolf. Um, and the main point I took from that is that bullying is tied to multiple mental health and physical health problems. And then we ended the day with a nice panel on the means of violence. Um, Mark Rosenberg. Um, presided over that panel and also served as a discussant. And, and he started off with the, you know, sort of the elephant in the room, at least in the United States, in terms of guns being, or firearms being a means for violence in the United States. And Daniel Webster gave a very compelling presentation about the fact that, we, you know, more guns equals more suicide. It's that simple. Um, Reducing gun availability to youth reduces youth suicide. Michael Phillips, though, brought us to the rest of the world and the fact that it's not guns everywhere else, but certainly in China and India and other countries that um, pesticide ingestion was an important, uh, important means of suicide. And he also presented data that showed it's not necessarily, even though it was the most lethal way to commit suicide in certain countries. It's not always the people with the highest intent to kill themselves that, that use, um, use that method. And then Mike Gluo, the reporter from the New York Times, talked about, I thought was a, a really disturbing issue, which is the restoration of guns that have been confiscated from people who are mentally ill by the police. Um, even if they have a diagnosis, there's way, there are legal procedures they can follow in order to get their guns restored. Uh, and, and that is a really important issue. So that was our day yesterday. Mark, do you have anything you want to, to add? I just want to say thank you, Peggy. I thought that was a, a wonderful summary that helps put today in perspective of what we heard and where we're trying to go. And I think our main goal here is to bring clarity to this whole area and to try to come away with a better understanding of what the problems are and what some of the solutions and paths forward might be. But thank you for that. I thought that was very, very helpful.